Hello, I'm Chief Pete Fisher with the Fife Police Department. Today we have a special edition of Chat with the Chief. We have Mayor Kim Roscoe as a guest today. We have an important topic we'd like to address together. We're going to talk about the recent police reform, legislative changes, and how they impact our community. Thank you for having me today here, Chief. As the mayor of Fife, I want to be able to talk to our community about how our police department has made the appropriate changes to their policies and procedures. And I also want to reassure the public that our officers are getting the in-service training they need. It's important we address and answer questions from the public because there has been so much discussion in the community that has been confusing and sometimes conflicting. We want to give a good foundation for our community about these changes and what it means for our local police force. You and your police officers have already adopted some of these processes and gone through a lot of training, right? That's correct, Mayor. We've been working with our prosecutor and our city attorney to make sure that our policies, our practice, and our in-service training meets the needs and allows us to be compliant with all the changes that took place this legislative session. Thanks for that good information. It's good to hear that the department has already been on the top of a lot of these things. What would you say uh, is a good way to start this conversation today? Do you wanna give an overview of uh, what you've done so far? Uh, I do, I think we'll talk about the major areas of the reform and then maybe we can talk about questions that you have regarding each of those. And the major topics really have to do with the impacts to police uh, pursuits, police use of force, uh, duty to intervene and report misconduct by officers or excessive use of force, and the use of military equipment or tactics. That's gonna be a lot that we're talking about today. How would you say these changes uh, specifically are impacting pursuits? So from a pers pursuit perspective, the impacts were pretty small for the Fife Police Department. Our, our policy really only allowed pursuits for violent felonies in the first place, with the exception of domestic violence assault in the fourth degree. So from a poly pr policy perspective, we made a couple of major changes. We removed the DV Assault 4 and only allow pursuits for uh, violent felonies. Um, the law does allow for officers to pursue for reasonable suspicion DUI. Um, I have chosen, after consulting with our legal advisors, not to include that. Um, mainly because one of the bigger changes is that you have to show that the need to apprehend the person is uh, greater than the imminent threat caused by the pursuit itself. And so when you talk about somebody that's under the influence of alcohol and they're driving at speeds and the police are pushing them through the pursuit process, we just didn't feel that was the best for our community. So we have restricted pursuits solely for violent felonies. So we did deviate a little bit from the law, but we made it more restrictive because we believe that's what's good for our community. The other major change is that it requires supervisor approval. Uh, and so really what that means is an officer sees a vehicle, they have to have probable cause that a person inside that vehicle has committed a violent offense as defined by the law, and then they need supervisor approval before they can actually initiate that pursuit. So really the training is the sergeants really need to be paying attention to what's going on, the calls, and they're probably gonna have to ask for clarification from that officer before they give authority to pursue. And again, um, there has to be probable cause of a violent felony under our policy in the law. The pursuit or the need to apprehend the person needs to outweigh the threat or the imminent danger caused by that pursuit, and it needs to have supervisor approval before it can go. So really what we should see is a reduction in our pursuits. I'm proud to say since I've been the chief, we've had a very restricted pursuit policy, and pursuits in our jurisdiction are, are very rare. So really the changes to ours are very small. It's a matter of fixing our policy, to conform with the law, we made it a little more restrictive, uh, and we are going to reinforce that training at our yearly emergency vehicle operation course driving training that we do uh, every two years for our officers and our supervisors. I'm gonna get back to a question on the training, especially with the new officers versus the old officers, but um, what are the options or what do you do about not being able to pursue or chase someone? Again, that's not a major change for us. Uh, if we have to let the person go, because you have probable cause, that means A, you know the identity, and B, you know the crime they committed. So you write that report up, you forward it to our investigations unit, they will do the follow-up, take that through conclusion, and they will send it to the prosecutor's office for charges, and they will either summon them to court, they will request us to go in person to attempt to arrest them at a later date, or they'll issue a warrant for their arrest. So really the changes just means we won't pursue and take into custody at that particular point in time. Okay, so there is going to be the, the built-in opportunity to 
follow up. It's not as if it's just we can't pursue them now. You do have the methods in place to follow up with a known, you know, when there's a known issue. We do, and that's a great question because I think people think this means we're gonna let criminal go, criminals go. What it means is we're gonna let them go right now. But because you have to have probable cause uh, to do the, the, the pursuit, if you don't have that, the information you do have, they'll go to our investigations unit, they'll do the follow-up. Um, and our investigations unit has an outstanding closure rate um, so we will get them, it'll just be at a later time. Okay, sounds good. Um, so the changes to the use of force laws are getting a great deal of coverage in the media, and there does not seem to be a great deal of consistency from city to city. What can you say about that? Uh, it's interesting, I think a lot of the confusion comes from a lack of definition in the laws themselves, such as the definition of physical force or serious physical harm. And so these are drivers on when you can apply force. The other major change to use of force laws was that uh, anytime you use force, you have to have probable cause um, to make an arrest, probable cause to an effect arrest. Uh, interestingly enough, um, the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chief did ask for clarification between those two. What's the difference between make an arrest and effect an arrest? And they didn't clarify that. And so legal advisors really are saying make an arrest is you have probable cause, Effect an arrest is that person has a warrant and no new PC. But again, that's not clear because it's not defined. What does no new PC mean? So again, if probable I- cause. Probable Probable cause. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you for catching that probable cause. And so we're guessing, and when I say we, I'm talking about our legal advisors. Uh, we've had a number of meetings across the state with police chiefs and legal advisors, uh, and it is clear that there is a great deal of confusion and opinions vary. And so departments, policies, and practices are varying based on their legal department's interpretation of the new laws and how they should be applied. Um, and again, I think part of that is just clearing up some of these languages, some of the language and the definitions in the new law so that we're all talking from the same point. Um, and then the other one is imminent harm. And so um, what that leaves out is this, uh, a lot of police work is predicated on what we call reasonable suspicion. And so that's not probable cause, it's not enough information to make an arrest but it has historically allowed police officers to detain somebody for a reasonable amount of time to do an investigation to make sure that a crime uh, has, uh, was about to or may occur. Um, and we were able to use reasonable force to detain that person while we're doing the investigation. That no longer exists. Uh, even though Terry v. Ohio, which is the guiding case law since the late 80s, um, federally says you can do that. In Washington State, we, we no longer can do that under how the new law is written. And even maybe more concerning is the Involuntary Treatment Act, Treatment Act in where officers encounter people that are gravely disabled, a threat to themselves or others, uh, we're supposed to take into custody either for their safekeeping or to prevent them from hurting somebody else. But the law clearly does not allow officers to use force to make an involuntary detention for mental health or a person that has experienced a mental health crisis. Um, and so that is very difficult in that we're trying to um, protect these people from themselves or protect the community from somebody that is experiencing these crises, but we don't have the authority under the law to use force to do that. Uh, and unfortunately, um, I don't think police have gotten the credit uh, for being as good as they are at resolving a lot of these issues. Um, what's getting the attentions are the ones that go bad. Um, and so we are trying to interpret what this means. And uh, we did ask the legislature during the session to uh, enlarge that definition to allow clearly in 1310 or the use of force bill, uh, the use of force to deal with people dealing with mental crises. They haven't done that. I do think that's one we're gonna have to clean up because the infrastructure in the communities does not exist to treat or allow enough resources to be spent on people experiencing mental illness. And so the police are it, but we don't have the authority now under the new law according to our legal advisors and many, to use force to make that happen. Uh, we had a great example where we had a person that felt suicidal. They were gonna jump in front of a car. Our officers went out there, had a conversation with them, talked them into voluntarily going for treatment, which was the best case scenario anyways. Uh, fire showed up, they were assessing the patient, we were waiting for an ambulance and the subject changed their mind. And so the subject said, I've changed my mind, can I go? The police officers, I can't use force to detain you. You're no longer an imminent threat because there's no traffic and you haven't made additional threats to harm yourself. 
felt they couldn't use force to detain the person, yet FIRE, under the Involuntary Treatment Act, says we have to take this person into custody. And again, we have competing um, disciplines that both agree what the law says, but don't agree on what the law says in regards to how we make that happen. Uh, luckily, we had a very experienced officer that was able to change that subject's mind through conversation, and it worked out. But those are the things that our officers are facing on a daily basis now. Um, and so really having the legislature get in here and clearing up some of this language in regards to the definitions of physical force, serious physical harm, and expanding that, uh, again, reasonable force, we should be de-escalating anytime we can. Um, and that's something I think, generally speaking, police officers have been fairly good at. Um, but the law now puts a bigger burden on officers in that we, when possible, have to exhaust all means of de-escalation. And so um, we try to do that. And so we're updating our training to make it more possible because if you go to a call like a shooting in process, progress, there's no chance to sit back and watch. You have to go in there and you have to keep people safe. And so the ability to de-escalate in that type of situation is say much different than a person calling and saying, I feel suicidal, and if a police, or police officer shows up, I'm gonna make him shoot me. We respond to those calls very differently, um, and the laws now really necessitate that we do do that. Right, right. That is a lot to ponder. Let's take a break and uh, regroup. I have some other questions that have come to mind as we've been having this conversation, so we'll be right back. Thank, Thank you, you, Mayor. In Fife, we think it's important that there's a continuing conversation between our community and our police department. That's why the Fife Police Department launched our Chat with the Chief video series. The series is hosted by Chief Pete Fisher and addresses questions and concerns that are important to our community. Do you have a question or topic you'd like to see addressed on a future episode of Chat with the Chief? We want to hear from you. Please email police at cityoffife.org or call 253-922-6633. And we're back with Chat with the Chief, and today we're discussing police reform in Washington State. So Chief, we keep hearing that the police uh, are misinterpreting the new laws. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I can, I think there's a number of things going into that. The first is that we each have our own legal advisors. And as we spoke earlier, they're not always interpreting the laws the same. And so the advice we're getting may differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction based on the attorneys we have serving us. Um, the police are not interpreting the laws. We are getting feedback from our legal advisors. But there's some great examples of that. Um, clearly, um, the intent of the legislature was to reduce and when possible, eliminate deadly encounters between the police and the community. Um, and, and that is a great effort. Um, but one of the things they did in um, 1054 or the police tactics bill, uh, they define military equipment. And one of the things in, there's, in that definition was the use of firearms or ammunition over 50 caliber or greater. Um, and really I think the intent was talking about sniper rifles or things that really are used in war and not necessary for um, civilian law enforcement. Uh, I think one of the unintended consequences but it also goes to the misinterpretation part, is that police departments have two platforms that deliver less lethal munitions. The first is 12 gauge shotguns that are converted to fire less lethal beanbag rounds or kinetic energy rounds, and two 40 millimeter launchers, uh, which is what we had before this law passed, and it was a, a rubber hardened projectile with a oleo resin capsicum payload, really um, mace or capstan. Um, and that allowed us to deal with people from a distance that may be armed, but it did give our officers a less lethal option. Some departments in Washington State, including the Fife Police Department, um, believe that those devices are a violation of the law because they are firearms by definition and their payload is ammunition greater than 50 caliber. Um, so because of that interpretation, we are taking them off the street. There's just as many, if not more police departments that say the legislative intent is to reduce deadly encounters with the police and the community, and they didn't mean these devices, so they are chosen or have chosen to keep these in circulation. Uh, the problem is if the police department is wrong or we get this wrong, not only there's civil liability for the department and the city and the community, um, but the police officer can be decertified. And so we really need to make sure that we're following the letter of the law. Uh, I am proud to report that there are other options out there, and for the Fife Police Department, 
Um, we bought five VKS platforms, and these are less lethal devices that are air launched, so they're not a firearm, um, but they do pretty much the same thing that those other two devices, the 12 gauge shotgun and the 40 millimeter launcher does. So while we are removing the shotgun platform and the 40 millimeter platform from use right now, we do have an alternative. So we are giving our officers and our community a less lethal option. Uh, ideally, I don't think that was a legislative intent. That was uh, one of the things that really needs to get cleaned up in language to allow us to use those devices. The nice part, if the legislature does clean that up, then we'll just have more options in the field later down the road when it comes to less lethal options. The other one, which I think is causing a lot of concern um, for police chiefs, for the legislators that were involved in adopting these laws or drafting them, and the community is uh, chiefs and sheriffs saying we can no, lo no longer respond to certain types of calls. Um, and that really is kind of a misinterpretation. Nothing that was passed prohibits us from responding uh, what chiefs and sheriffs are saying is because of how the law is written, if we respond, we are putting our officers and our communities in jeopardy of being sued, uh, of potentially getting charged criminally, um, sued civilly, and being decertified. And so uh, you think about police work. I've been doing this since 1994. The training has always been the same. And now we've changed completely how officers interact with the public in regards to what we call Terry stops or reasonable suspicion stops where you no longer can use force. Um, well, these are, can be stressful events. And so officers are gonna respond with the training that they've had. And while we are training very hard to ensure that we are abiding by the new laws and policies, you have to overcome years and years and years of training. So we wanna make sure that our officers are making good decisions and not under stress so that they go to the old brain and make a mistake. This is exactly the question that uh, came up earlier. So thank you for getting back to this. Um, so what I just heard you say is that, you know, you've got some new officers coming in and we're going to be training. And, you know, if you have some younger officers on the force, I should say they've been there less, for less years, um, the new training for them will come easier. And the new training for the older officers, that sometimes may be a challenge, but it sounds like you are addressing those um, very thoughtfully with how you're approaching when and how often officers are getting this new information. We are, and I think that goes to the, the also the misinterpretation as we talked about, uh, you know, that suicide call or we call suicide by cop where someone calls 911. We had one recently in Fife uh, where a person had called several family members saying they wanted to end their life. Um, call the police that as soon as they show up, I'm gonna make them shoot me. And so, look, the, the main tactics here are time, distance, shielding. Well, if you're being told when you show up, I'm gonna make you shoot me, why would we go? But that is not a person in crisis we can just not respond to. And so our officers were very thoughtful about the response. They talked to the community members. They attempted to use the co-responder program, which is a countywide program and resource that has mental health professionals on staff with the sheriff's department. Uh, and it's a regional resource. So all the departments in Pierce County can utilize that. Uh, unfortunately, the co-responder was not able to establish contact with the actual person that was suicidal. Um, so we took that all the way to exhaustion short of going there. Uh, the nice part is that the next day the gentleman was fine, sobered up, actually made contact. And so that worked out really well. Um, and so from the Fife Police Department, as we're working this, my directing is we're always gonna go to a life safety issue. Go to could look very different. Uh, if we get a call of shots being fired or an active assault, we're going. We're gonna go and we're gonna figure it out. We're gonna have to be deliberate about how we detain people because we can't use force for an investigative stop. Um, we're gonna have to ensure that we have probable cause before we do use force, but we're still gonna go to that. Uh, as we talk about self-harm cases in particular, the response may look very different. It could be by telephone, it could be by distance. Um, but we are gonna slow those interactions down. Uh, we're gonna use time, distance, and shielding to ensure that we do not push or force an issue and end up using force um, and injuring somebody that actually needs help. Um, but it would be a great service, I think, not only to our community, to the police department, if the legislature took steps to clean that language up so that we can render the type of service that we need to. Uh, I think what got missed in this session was uh, yeah, police and mental health calls can go bad, but the vast majority of them are resolved successfully where people are getting help 
and the police officer successfully de-escalated it, talked them into getting treatment and resolved it for the evening and kept the community safe. And I think that got overshadowed by a number of bad cases that happened in recent history. Um, and so hopefully we will get that back so that we can better serve um, or even better yet, maybe the state can properly fund wraparound services where we have people that are specially trained and we no longer need the police to respond to mental health calls or at the very minimum have the ability to do so when there's a great deal of jeopardy to the mental health providers or the community as a whole. And it does seem, I mean, even nationally, I think that there's movement around those wraparound services and an increase in, in uh, mental health services in uh, police work. So um, the last I want to talk about is duty to intervene, but I also just wanted to mention, um, it's good to hear you talk about the unintended consequences and that there is a movement, and I know that you're even part of uh, this interpretation of laws, and there is feedback going down to the legislature around some of these unintended consequences. So I think that for me, that gives me hope that we can bring the pendulum back a little bit and create new legislation or reform last year's legislation to continue to allow the police force to act in a way that will uh, protect the public to the best of your ability. Um, but again, lastly, I wanted to talk about duty to intervene. And I think that you were kind of uh, getting there in some of the mental health crisis situations you talked about. What else can you tell us about that? So duty to intervene is not a new concept. That's something that's been in our policy for quite a while. And really that is when an officer sees an officer engaged in misconduct. And really before this legislative session, specifically excessive force, they had a duty to intervene, whether that was to physically restrain or stop the action. Um, and then to follow up with reporting to a supervisor. Uh, this last legislative session, this actually became a law. Um, and so really, we didn't have to make any changes to our policy other than the reporting requirements and how that gets reported to the first level supervisor and then up the chain of command eventually to my office. The other changes now under the law is that the department is required to report that to the Criminal Justice Training Commission, which issues all of us, all police officers, their license or their certification in Washington State to be peace officers. Um, and the only other real main difference is that if you do engage in excessive force or you fail to intervene when you're present during the use of excessive force, you actually can be decertified. So from a policy standpoint, the requirement to intervene and report was already there. Uh, we did have to add some language about reporting, when you had to report, who you had to report to. And then there's some additional burdens on command staff to ensure that we did notify the state certifying body when we became aware of an incident. And then again, the state law really changed uh, the dynamic and the consequences for failing to intervene or report and that they could take your license away or decertify you as a police officer. That's, um, that's great information. So I think that's all the time we have. Um, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, Mayor, I really appreciate your leadership and the leadership of the council and the support that we get in the city of Fife and the dedication of our elected officials to ensure that we're providing the best community safety that we can. Well, I think it's important for our citizens to hear how the PD is training its officers, and I really appreciate how much context you've provided today. Is there a place where folks can go for more information? Yeah, if anyone has questions or concerns, they can always contact us or visit our website at cityoffife.org forward slash police reform. And if anyone has a topic or idea they'd like to talk to us about on Chat with the Chief, please email us at police at cityoffife.org or call us at 253-922-6633. Thanks for the conversation today, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you for being here with us. This is an important topic. We will get more information as it's available. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions.